Well, welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we have Mike Barron, crime and cosmic writer extraordinaire. Mike Barron, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Basically, this is the comic book historian's version of This Is Your Life. So, Jim, let's start it off. Okay. So, um, I know you were born in 1949, but I know very little about those early years uh, before you uh, actually started in comics. Can we go through that a little bit? Um, uh, where you were born, um, what, who your parents were, what were they like, your upbringing, those things. Well, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin, but when I was about six years old, my folks moved to Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, I lived in Pittsburgh till I was, uh, I think, uh, nine or ten. And then we moved to Mitchell, South Dakota, which is where I really grew up. It's the home of the Corn Palace. My dad had a, a women's clothing store there. Uh, I have two sisters. One's older, one's younger. They're both geniuses. Uh and uh, I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere, which I f felt was a very valuable experience for me. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I rode my bike everywhere. Uh, it was in Mitchell that I discovered comic books. It was an Uncle Scrooge comic, to be specific, and I was just so entranced with it. Uh, I picked them all up that I could, and, and you got them off spinner racks at the drugstore. And I started to write to the Walt Disney company. I said, who wrote this? Who drew this? And and finally, they said, you want Carl Barks. Uh, and they gave me the guy's address. I think he lived in Seattle. So I wrote Mr. Barks. And I said, Mr. Barks, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, would you do me a drawing of Uncle Scrooge? And he sent me this some oh, weeks nice. later. Wow, that's fantastic. I also discovered books there. And my big revelation was walking out of a cigar store with a John D. McDonald novel. It was Travis McGee, Deep Blue Goodbye. And I know I that. I know that. I know that really well. That's the one that has the uh, rabbit speech in it, isn't it? These, are, these. Well, I don't know. I haven't read it in years, but it began a lifelong love affair. And I had a revelation on the sidewalk there that Mr. McDonald wasn't writing these for his health. He was doing this for a living. And it kind of formed in the back of my mind that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and I always I always had this unshakable confidence that I could write. I don't know where it came from because I really didn't start to write until I was in high school. I went to three years of high school in Mitchell, South Dakota. And then uh, for my senior year, we moved back to Madison, Wisconsin. And I finished my senior year at West High School where I started writing for the school newspaper. And after high school, I attended the University of Wisconsin, uh, where I majored in uh, political science and a fat lot of good it's done me. Uh, but at the time I started writing, and what happened is I went over to a friend's house and he had an underground newspaper called Takeover. It came out once a week and was sticking it to the man up against the wall, all that stuff. I went over to his house and there were hundreds of LPs stacked up against the wall. I said, Mark, where'd you get these records? He says, oh, the record company sent them to us. Listen, if you write something about them, you can have them. So I loaded up. I went home. I started listening. I started writing and I never stopped. So I, I really, the first serious writing I ever did was music reviews and I'm still doing it. Uh, after the college, uh, I moved to Boston because I heard there were newspapers there that would hire anyone. But before that happened, I got to back up. Uh, we rented a house and I was in my uh, senior year at the University of Wisconsin. There was a knock at the door one day. I went down. It was Dennis Kitchen. And uh, he said, hey, we heard that you wanted to uh, to write reviews and stuff. And I have a newspaper called the Milwaukee Bugle. We'd like you to write for us. So that's how I met Dennis Kitchen. It started a long relationship. Uh, I wrote for Kitchen Sink for many years. I didn't start writing uh, for them until after I moved to Boston. Uh, but I met Dennis when I was in college. Well, then I moved to Boston. What year was that exactly, you think? I moved to Boston in 1971. And I answered an ad in the Boston Phoenix for uh, uh, people who were willing to live on a government uh, uh, campus for a month and smoke the government's dope and take tests all day long. It was just like college. 
<laughs> now, so I want to I want to get a timeline straight a little bit. I know that you did a text piece for uh, Weird uh, Trips magazine in 1974 uh, for Kitchen Sink. Did you already know Dennis before that? Yes. Okay. So, so a lot of times that's listed as your first. Uh, uh, published piece for related to comics on any level um but your relationship actually predates that by by uh, several years is that right yes okay that so, was the piece on modifying the squirt gun right yeah i think i believe so yeah that was how to how to take an ordinary squirt gun and jack it up so it had like twice the power and carried more water the other thing I wanted to say, um, based on a remark you made a few minutes ago about uh, political science for all that it good it did you, and then you went immediately to the music. It seems to me that politics and music have been your two core thematics almost from the very beginning. It's it's there in <laughs> Nexus. It's obviously there in something like Sonic Disruptors, but it, it flows through your entire body of work, wouldn't you say? Well, I do say my fiction is informed by current events and that like most writers, I snatch a lot of material out of what's happening in the news. And I, I don't deny that that uh, Nexus has a, a very specific political view, but that's always secondary to my main goal, which is to entertain. I have three rules. Number one is it's my job to entertain. Number two is show, don't tell. And number three is be original. Well, We'll, I'll, I'll challenge you again when you get to your novels and some of the other stuff, because okay. I think they, they do they do lean toward both music, music rights, things like that, and also in terms of uh, various politics. Um, but Nexus stands out. But Sonic Disruptors we'll talk about, too, because that's very political, wouldn't you say? It certainly was. <laughs> All right. So... Um, Let's let's go to uh, the origins of, of Nexus in 1981. But before that, were you just writing? You were you were working as a, a journalist to some degree, correct? Well, yeah, I was actually working at an insurance company when I met Steve Root. I was phoned by a newspaper editor I knew and he said, hey, there's some guy down here trying to sell us his art. And he draws just like you, which is a joke because I've been trying to draw for years and and uh, I never achieved professional level but i'm good enough that anybody can look at my drawings and see what i'm trying to draw which is how i wrote my comics for 10 years was by drawing each page out by hand but to jump around a little bit when i moved to boston and i participated in that study i came out and i wrote it up and that's how i broke into journalism uh, and i became the music editor for the boston phoenix and it was my job to go out night after night uh, and listen to live music and interview the musicians, which was a great joy for me. And I saw a great many musicians uh, that I loved and, and uh, I just lived music. I mean, what, what could be a greater job for, for a music aficionado than to be paid to go and review concerts and performances and talk to the musicians? So what kind of music are we talking about? Well, a lot of it was jazz. I'm a lifelong jazz fan. And uh, I got to review and speak to many great jazz greats, including Les McCann. Uh, 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 I interviewed Jaco Pastorius. I saw Charles Mingus one night at the jazz basement. Uh, uh, Chick Corea, I saw numerous times with his return to Forever Group. Uh, and uh, I saw Weather Report, which was with Wayne Shorter. I think Jocko was in that band. Uh, and a lot of guys, I, I don't even remember. I'd have to go back and look through the clippings if I've saved any, but a lot of pop music too. Uh, Freddie Mercury, I'll never forget. Uh, I had lunch with him and Brian May. They were on their first American tour and we met at a hotel downtown and uh, Freddie was very charming. I couldn't stop staring at his teeth. Uh, and, oh. <laughs> and, and I said, how did you come to name your band Queen? And he, he went like this. Oh, I don't know. It was just the most outrageous name we could think of. <laughs> so uh, just on music for one minute, when you were um, when you were working at first, did you um, 
would you run into, would you ever see Howard shake and did you ever talk to him and you guys talk about jazz? Cause I know he's a, a, a real jazz uh, fan as well. Well, I've met Shaken, but we've never discussed music. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Uh, did when you were at first? Did you did you talk to any of the other creators that were going on at the same time? I know you worked oh, with sure. Grell, Grell later on. Sure, I never worked with Mike, but but we're friends, you know. And I run in, I ran in, I'm still running into him at conventions, or at least I was until they stopped having conventions. Uh, and uh, I met Can a lot of guys. Can you collaborate on the um, on the Brave and Bold with the Butcher and Green Arrow in question to some degree? You know, Mike may have contributed a story uh, to to that sequence, but he didn't illustrate anything I wrote. I'd love to have him illustrate something I write, but I don't know if Mike's even doing continuity anymore. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, but, um, but uh, let's let's get. let's try to um, get toward the um, uh, the creation of Nexus with with Root. Well, um, I met the dude and we st decided to work together right there. And the first thing I wrote was a four part story about some guy trying to sell en encyclopedias door to door in a dystopian future. And it was a real misfire because I didn't anticipate the internet because because nobody's going to buy a set of encyclopedias these days when they can download everything. Uh, and uh, everything's on the internet and, and nobody wants the books anymore, except for us book lovers, we have all the books. I have an encyclopedia on the shelf behind me. Uh, and, but we were in the right place at the right time in the uh, Capital City Distribution, the second, larger distrib the second largest distributor of comics in the world, uh, decided to launch their own comic title. Uh, and uh, so Dude and I were kicking it and I wanted something dramatic. And my first thought was, what if when the protagonist shows up, every time he shows up, somebody dies? Well, that would be dramatic. But how do you justify that? And how do you make the protagonist sympathetic? Uh, so I decided to make him a reluctant executioner of mass murderers driven by his dreams to exterminate the source of the dreams, to exterminate the tyrants he dreams about lest the dreams recur and become more severe until they drove him mad. But where did these dreams come from? They came from an insane alien who had chosen Nexus to be the conscience of his race. So uh, it may not make sense to human beings, but it made sense to the insane alien who's known as the Merc. Uh, and he wasn't introduced until issue number 19. But did you uh, know but, he was, did you understand who Merc was um, from day one? No, all this stuff was just kind of floating around. When I started writing the stories, my goal was to grab the reader by the throat with the immediate situation. And I was probably uh, seven or eight issues into Nexus before I formed the Merc in my mind. And a lot of storytellers work that way. They'll put something into a story and they don't know why they do it. But 100 pages down the road, that becomes the key to the resolution. And that's happened to me countless times. But I did think of the Merc early on. It was just a matter of building up to him. And uh, I've read that you're, the, you mentioned earlier that the way you were approaching it all as a storyteller for, uh, for your early, early years until you switched over to direct uh, detailed scripts at, at some point. But for a long time, you were actually drawing panel by panel and basically drawing the comic for the artist to then go in and do his his version of it. Is that right? That's unusual, that, isn't it? Uh, it's, it is unusual, but not unheard of. Uh, Archie Goodwin worked that way, and I believe Harvey Picar. Uh, editors and artists loved it because you could tell at a glance what was going on in the page. My art is crude, but it's good enough to, to give the idea. And it taught me a great many things about comic book writing. It taught me pacing, how much weight a page could bear, but most importantly, it taught me to think about what happens next. And that's the essential question in all fiction. The reader has to care what happens next to turn the page. And every time I finished a panel, I think, well, what happens next? What is the logical extension of these events? So what made you switch over to full scripts? I was wrecking my back. I've had I had no formal training, uh, and I was hunched over on a on a 
horizontal surface all the time. Uh, I'll still do it if I have to get an idea across. Uh, but I found that my scripts are very visual as well, and they leave nothing to be desired. They're very concise. They're not, they're not lengthy. Uh, you know, if I'm writing a 24-page script, and that's my preferred length for a single issue, that uh, it often comes out to 18 to 19 pages of, of printed copy. And that's, uh, it's not double spaced, but uh, there's spaces between all the, the panel descriptions. It goes like this, page one, panel one, horizontal, exterior day, a strip mall in a Midwestern town with a liquor store in the corner, a karate school in the middle and a laundry on the right. And there's a pickup truck in the uh, parking lot, voices from within. And then you have the word balloons extending from the, the, the mall. So detailed, but not Alan Moore detailed. No, in fact, I, dude was illustrating a, a Dave Gibson story once. And I went over to his house. He says, you want to see a piece of shit? Do you want to see a piece of shit? And he picked up this script. He was really <laughs> thinking, threw it at the wall. Blam, pages everywhere. He says, <laughs> now, I guess Dave, Dave was a very prolix writer. Now, talking about that with with um, with Steve, um, are you guys? Did you guys become good friends? Are you? Good oh yeah, friends? And we're still good friends. Because you worked together for a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, in in comics, we've talked to a lot of people who had that kind of relationship, and at some point, there's a falling out uh, or a difference of opinion about the characters or whatever. You guys didn't run into that. Oh well, we certainly had our ups and downs. A couple of years ago, he. He uh, hired me to write an original Nexus series for him. Uh, and it, it, he said, well, what's the ultimate Nexus story? And I immediately said, Nexus versus Galactus. Well, we can't use Galactus, so I created Gormando. And I wrote this big script for him. But when dude got it, he changed all my lines. I wasn't too happy about that. So, Was that the, is that going to, did that evolve, evolve into the novel that you're working on? That the novel's done. It's out. Oh, is it out? Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I, I knew that that was the impetus for it was was that. Um, yeah, when you were, when you were about to publish that dude's about to publish his version now. It's up on Indiegogo. Oh, OK. Um, when you were at Capitol, who were you working with? Was there any um, comics people that we would know that you were you were um, uh, that was in charge of, of the project? Well, Richard Bruning was the art director and he yeah. went on to become art director at DC and Milton Greep was the head and the president and Milton today runs the industry website icv2.com which is the best source there is for industry news about comics, gaming, and movies. And Milton and I remain good friends. Okay. And, and let's talk about the, the black and white series first, the three volumes. Now, obviously, uh, Rude is progressing as an artist with every, every issue. All the time. You know, I mean, the the change from those first issues to what it becomes when it goes to color in those six issues under Capitol is amazing progress. Yeah. Uh, were, were you guys aware of how much better you're getting and everything's flowing better um, as you're learning to do this? I think so, because I was very pleased with my work when the comic came out. Uh, sometimes I'd read them. Usually I don't because I wrote them, but, but when I read them, I, I could think, you know, this is a pretty good story. You know, I'm not cheating the reader here. I, um, I have from the, the one that included the record album or the, or the record um, uh, on Ford throughout. And I, I went back uh, this morning and reread the first six issues of volume two, the, uh, the color issues. And I was surprised that, Everything's there. I mean, you most of what you're going to do for the rest of the run, you set up all those characters um, in those first six issues. It's kind of amazing how much you pack into into that. Um, were these exist some of these existing ideas, or were you just flowing like crazy during that that short time period? 
Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, I will carry ideas with me for years, for decades even, before I find a place to use them. Uh, I have titles that I'm still waiting to use. I had one title that uh, I came up with in college. It was called Trail of the Loathsome Swine. And it was a play on words because my parents' favorite Western was Trail of the Lonesome Pine, starring Fred McMurray. And and so I just, the Trail of the Loathsome Swine. But it, 30 years later, I finally found the story to go with it. And it's about a boy who hunts down the feral hog that killed his sister. Wow. Oh, that's that's really cool. Um, so like like um, the hammer and some of those characters and, and Dave and things, were, were they all created for Nexus or were those like things that you had in mind already in your head? No, those were created for Nexus and the heads. I mean, that that stands out uh, because you see it later on in things like um, uh, Futuropolis and stuff. I mean, these ideas, the floating heads are there and, and you're doing them first. Um, that, that's all part of it. Were you a big science fiction fan? Because it's such oh, yeah. a science fiction. Oh, yeah. what, what kind of science fiction did you like at the time? I read everything. Clifford Simic, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein. Eventually, Phil Jose Farmer became my favorite mostly because of his World of Tears series. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I recent well, it wasn't so recent, about 10 years ago, I read uh, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, and that blew my head apart. I mean, it's such a visionary novel. Yeah. It's such a, a, a triumph of the imagination. It just goes to show you that, that a, a good thinker can come up with new stories that will astonish you at, at any age. Well, let's talk about Farmer a little bit in terms of his influence, because his um, he's a favorite of mine as well. I'm I'm probably more partial to the Riverworld uh, books than than anything else. Um, when I think the first thing I read from him was probably uh, that short story in Dangerous Vision in Harlan Ellison's anthology. Um, what was what was it about Farmer that drew you to him more than than some of the other writers? Was it the, the wordplay? Because he writes like nobody else. No, it was the ideas. It was the ideas? And, and, and I mentioned uh, the World of Tears series. Yeah. Uh, and I read those while I was hitchhiking through England. I, I picked the paperbacks up there for a song. And, and uh, just the sheer imagination of being able to create your own world and the problems that that would create. Uh, it just, uh, it just captured my imagination like nothing before since. And that led me to a great much, great many other farmer books, including his Edgar Rice Burroughs pistache, uh, uh, pastiches, pastachio he's pastiche. He's unknown. Yeah. 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 But, uh, the world of tears series is, is, uh, Still my favorite, uh, but I got a. I then I bought uh, two years scattered bodies go, and I just pulled that book out. It's a first edition. It listed for like six dollars. That's what that book cost, and and now you can't touch it for less than a hundred bucks. Oh, one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and you're right. You know, I hadn't thought about it, but that has so many ideas in it. The the series as it goes through the the various volumes. And it's like Nexus in that way, in that it packs in so many mysteries and finding. Um, and it's one of those where I think one issue I would say is sometimes the mystery is more interesting than the actual reveal or the solution. I agree. Um, you know, and that's that's a tricky part about science fiction because the fans want the answer. But then when you get the answer, um, it takes some of the fun out of it. And I, I think even with Nexus, I, I felt that a little bit once we got to the Merc uh, at some point, it was like, ah, I almost rather wondered what was going to happen, although I enjoyed it. Um, let's talk about Badger, just because that also starts at, at Capitol. Um, that was was you like with with Nexus, there's a little bit of a co-creation thing. I understand that. Uh, the idea was yours, even the li the lightning bolt design was yours, but you, you're often listed as co-creator with Steve Rude because you guys 
did it together. Badger, you're always listed as the uh, the creator of that. Um, what was the impetus for that character? And and talk about that in that in that first series because I think, like I said, Nexus was was like full blown almost in those first six issues. Badger starts as one thing and it, it changes, which I think is appropriate for the character to each time be something different. But Badger in those first issues is a very, he's almost a supporting character in his own series. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, I discovered Jeffrey Butler on a poster in uh, Madison. He did a poster. So I got in touch with him and I said, Jeff, do you want to do comics? And he said, sure. And I said, well, what do you want to draw? He says, I want to draw druids. So I wrote this, <laughs> I wrote this 12 page story in which this cantankerous weather wizard in fifth century Wales uh, so irritates his fellow w wizards, druid wizards, that they hire the Vikings to take him to the, drop him off the edge of the world. Uh, and Jeff drew it out and it was beautiful. And I took it in to show the boys at Capitol. And uh, Mills said, nah, we want a costume superhero. We want a costume crime fighter. Uh, and so I said, well, Jeff, they want a costume crime fighter. And, and he says, well, I don't want to waste those pages. So I said, fine, we'll work them into the story. Oh, uh, that makes sense. And my first thought was, why would anybody put on a costume and fight crime? They'd have to be crazy. And I was reading the, the minds of Billy Milligan at the time about a multiple personality. Uh, and so it struck me that I could make him a multiple personality. And also because everything in Madison is badger this and badger that, the badger. So he became a uniquely Wisconsin character. Yeah. Alex, you want to take us to the, the end yeah. capital? So, um, so that that's cool about the multiple personality because it seems like there's a lot of um, comedy. You throw a lot more comedy in Badger, obviously, than Nexus, and it seems like there's a lot of um, it's almost like Deadpool, but before Deadpool was even made. Everybody says that. It's almost like uh, like what makes Deadpool cool is this Badger ingredient that they just because he wasn't like that in the beginning. Then you throw Badger in, and now Deadpool is a lovable character. So I almost kind of feel like uh, that. Like that's really from you. And I know Moon Knight had a multiple personality, but your version is funnier, more interesting. Um, and uh, so um, that that is that shows that you're kind of futurist as far as that goes, because that becomes like huge later on, you know, in media in general, right? Oh, uh, thanks. Do you feel like, do you, do, you, do you ever feel like, man, you know, that uh, that's my thing. Have you, have you ever felt that way? Well, no, you know, synchronicity happens all the time. I remember the year there were two Christopher Columbus movies. Yeah. And then remember the year there were two volcano movies. Yeah. And two wide earth movies and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Two just, meteorite movies. Yeah. It, it, it's a constant. Yeah. So I guess there's some, something that is something in the air at times. Um, right. So now uh, a, a couple of quick uh, Nexus questions. So I've heard Space Ghost, uh, Alex Toth, Space Ghost being part of it, it, it was did that factor in when you were designing the costume no not really uh, that's all dude's contribution he's he's a, a big fan of alex toth uh, -huh. uh russ manning uh, jack kirby most especially yeah and, and dr seuss and you can see all those influences oh that's cool now this concept of 500 years in the future was that like a buck rogers uh, did that factor in at all for you no not at all i just figured well that's a good good time to set it in nobody yeah. knows what's going to be happening yeah yeah day. unimaginable so create create the image um then there's this discussion of like computerized societal memories overwhelming media channels um and a lot of that's kind of going on today so this is more of my futurist um you know mike baron futurist uh do you feel like yeah i kind of feel like i saw some of this coming as far as those concepts well maybe a little bit i mean once the internet was established uh I just extrapolated from that. It's not too hard a stretch. And now, I mean, everybody says Buck Rogers, remember what, or Dick Tracy, remember they had the two way wrist radio? Yeah. Well, now we have it, only it's TV. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, so now, what, what happened where Capital Comics ends 
and then all the titles go to first. What what happened uh, during that time exactly? Well, the Capitol, they loved comics, but they didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't uh, have the ins and outs of distribution nailed down. Uh, they didn't have a well-oiled machine to keep the thing going. So uh, they shopped it around and, and I insisted on going with first because mm. I liked what they were doing. Uh, I saw Warp by Neil Adams and they were doing uh, Mike Grell and they were doing American Flag. And I said, well, let's go with first. Mm. So we arranged a meeting at the Belvedere Oasis, which spanned the interstate between Madison and Chicago and unfortunately is no longer there. But at that meeting, we decided to go with first. It was with Mike Gold who was there. Hmm. Okay, so what was your impression of Mike Gold and uh, and how you got into first comics? Mike Gold is a, is a wonderful human being and a great editor. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I just worked with first happily for 10 years. You know, I wish they'd never gone under. There are a lot of reasons put forth. Uh, probably the greatest was high overhead. They moved out of the attic at Evanston and into a big fancy building down in the loop. Mm. Uh, and there were other reasons, but you know, it was a great run. The, the comics were great. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were lucky when dark horse picked us up. Right. Yeah. And that, that Nexus uh, seven through 70, that was for first comics that went from 85 to 91. So that was a pretty long length of time. That, that's about six years. As far as comic professional years, that's 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 quite a while. Did 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 it? Did you notice signs of change into '91, or was it pretty much the same working relationship as far as putting your comics in? Oh, it was the same for us because we didn't live in Chicago. We just do our stuff and send it in. Uh huh. Okay. And then now. Um, just kind of a, a question about you working with Steve Rude. You know, there's that documentary on him. Have you seen that? Yes. I'm yeah. In it. Yeah, you're in it exactly. And uh, so he, there's this whole thing about, um, you know, his emotions. You know, he's a very talented artist, obviously, but there's this kind of question of, of they 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 refer to the me mental illness, bipolar. And he, sometimes he's really into doing the art. Sometimes he can't do art for a couple of weeks. And there's this energy, these swings. Did that factor in in how you were uh, how you were putting issues together? No, I don't think so. I don't really think it. You know, there were times when he was unable to uh, make the deadline, and that's why we had a lot of fill-in artists mm -hmm. at uh, first. But when we switched to Dark Horse, we were at a more leisurely pace. We weren't putting out a monthly book. We put out four or six issue miniseries. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would wait until they were ready to go before they published them. So it didn't really affect his work there. Okay, there you go. And uh, and that makes sense. And that uh, kind of falls into like putting TV seasons out, right? Like get it all done and then um, kind of leak them out. And I guess that's how the miniseries works uh, as opposed to like a monthly strict schedule. Um, and uh, now you also worked with some other artists. Was there any differences as far as let's say uh, with Steve Rude versus, let's say, someone like Paul Smith for a couple issues. Did you have to explain more to other artists versus Steve Rude, whom you co-created it with? Not with Smitty. You know, he was a big fan, was familiar with the comic before we asked him to draw it. And I think he did some of his best work on that title. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. It's really yeah. good. It is. Yeah, it's a, it's a gem seeing some of those uh, those issues by Smith because I, I loved his X-Men. And so when I ran into that, I was like, wow, this is great. Um, so then, and, uh, you, you got an ink pot award in 1988 and, uh, now in 1990, um, hammer of God one through four, uh, with Steve Epting, how was working with Steve Epting and tell us about Great. that story. I'd love to work with him again, mm -hmm. uh, about the story. I'd have to reread those issues to, to remind myself what <laughs> I wrote. But, uh, is, but is there like, let's say as a writer, um, you know, you put scripts by this time, are you just putting in text script and then sending it to the artist? Uh, are there any phone calls, any sort of um, co-plotting going on at that point? Occasionally, I would often ask a writer what he liked to draw. I mean, mm -hmm. an artist. Mm -hmm. And I would try to write to his strengths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now as far as Judah the Hammer, was that a fun, um, uh, a fun one to write, fun character to write? Oh, yeah. They're all fun characters to yeah. read, even the yeah. grim ones. Yes. If I'm not having fun, the reader's not going to have fun. I see. Yeah, so you kind of put yourself into the story and 
and you're having fun as you're as you're writing it out. Is uh, and and do you imagine yourself as a reader at, at the same time? I think that all writers do. I think you have to say, uh -huh. well, how is this going to affect someone else? Does it make sense? Is it entertaining? Uh -huh. During this period of time, do you have any favorites, any particular favorites as far as characters uh, are concerned? You mean the characters that I've created or yeah. other people? As far as your as far as your creations, yes. Well, I, Nexus and Badger are still very near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm working on Florida Man with Todd Mulrooney and we're very excited about that. I don't know if you've seen the art, but it's jaw dropping mm -hmm. and it's a complete change. Right. It's a totally no, different genre. Yeah. Yeah. No super heroics. It's, there's no science fiction. Uh, there, uh, uh, hopefully people will, will recognize a little bit of themselves in Gary Dubé and mm -hmm. it's very funny. I mean, the only purpose of that comic is to make you laugh. Yeah. It oh, is, that's cool. It, and it will. It's the funniest comic ever written. I guarantee your head will explode. Your eyes will pop out of your skull. And as soon as you're done, you'll turn to the nearest person and say, you've got to read this. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I'm excited to check that out. Mike, um, I, I just have one quick question in terms of what we're talking about, the, um, uh, the characters in Nexus. Were there ones that fans liked and so you, they got more play or became more central to the storyline because of the fan reaction? Or was it always just about your you as a fan reaction? Because I know some were, were, were you would see on the letters pages where some were, were super popular or others maybe, you know, they'd say, I don't want to see Tyrone anymore. He's, he's irritated. <laughs> no, that really didn't affect me. Because as I said, it's the story rules. It's whatever the story requires. Uh, and my goal was to grab the reader by the throat with the situations and the characters. And I would just follow that path wherever it led. Uh, I don't think that I've featured or or diminished any character due to, to reader appeal uh, because I have a pretty good judge of what makes a good story and as long as I'm on that path I'm pretty happy now the the in, in Nexus when it comes to like killing dictators or having vengeance <laughs> toward dictators um, what was there any sort of real life dictator in the early 80s that you were thinking about at the time no, not really. You know, mm -hmm. the, all of history's great slaughterers, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, mm -hmm. all those little tin pot dictators down in South America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I got a, a definitely a South American vibe myself when I was reading when I was reading that. Um, so then uh, now when it comes to writing the Badger, you went again for uh, this also went through first for uh, uh, 60 issues plus a miniseries from 85 to 91 during the first run first comics run um you know when you're coming up with the quips and the storylines and putting all that kind of you're hitting the reader from multiple sides verbally um it are you know you say that you you know you put yourself into it but it, it seems like there's just so much spontaneity and new it feels new every time uh, you know do you have do you have inspirations that it, like do you have to kind of take a break and you feel ever, you ever get burnt out and you have to like watch a comedian or watch something funny to kind of get that funny bone back? How, how does that? Well, well yes and no. Uh, uh, the, read, the writer has to surprise himself mm. uh, before he can surprise the reader. And, and any writer who's accomplished uh, knows that you will create a character and at some point that character will take over and tell you what he's going to do next. Uh, well, I have a rule is when I don't know what happens next, mm -hmm. I back away from the typewriter or whatever I'm doing. Uh, I take my pen and pad and I write down all the possibilities that could happen, no matter how crazy. And sooner or later, I'll find the path forward. And if it doesn't come to me, I'll set it aside. But I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. I'll, sometimes I'll think about it for days. And eventually the answer will come to me. So I've learned the hard way uh, that that you don't proceed unless you know what's going to happen next. Uh, but I also believe that the writer has to surprise himself before he can surprise the reader. And so I'm open to being surprised by my own characters. And as I said before, uh, any good writer worth his salt is going to insert something early on in the story and he won't know why, 
yeah. until 100 or 200 pages later when that something becomes the key to the resolution or to the story. For me, the perfect ending always comes as a complete surprise and also inevitable upon reflection. Hmm. So during a story arc, do you have the ending in mind when you're writing the beginning or or is this or, or, or does it kind of flesh out as you're as you're doing it? A little bit of both. Uh, you know, I, I believe in moral fiction, which means good triumphs over evil, sometimes at a terrible cost. Uh -huh. uh, but when I'm writing a story, be it a novel or a comic, uh, I do have an idea how it's supposed to end. And I yeah. work toward that idea. And it's how I get there that makes up the story. I see. So do you, do you have a last ish, uh, a, a final story of Nexus? when it's time to close it out no yeah that's cool that's kind of uh, eric larson's like that with savage dragon like the, it's still open-ended um that's pretty cool um chronicles of quorum 1986 to 1988 um you were adapting uh michael moorcock's sword trilogy with mike mignola then it was jackson guise tell us about your involvement in that project well, first asked me to do that, uh, and it was a very it's easy to adopt, adapt uh, novelists who write so visually. Uh, and, they, and I took a book, you know, they say, here's the first chronicle of Coram. And if the book was 350 pages long, and I knew I had to turn it into six issues, mm -hmm. I would just roughly divide those pages up by six. Yeah. Not hard and fast, because... Mm -hmm you want to follow the natural contours of the story, which means that each issue begins when a chapter starts and each issue ends when a chapter ends and you space it out and you time it uh, until it all fits. And I prided myself on not using any of my own language. It's all Moorcocks. Mm -hmm. And the same thing when I adapted Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire for Dark Horse. Yeah, so that's interesting. So in reading it, then you kind of, um, it sounds like in, in adapting it, you, you read it and then you almost put yourself in the shoes of the writer and you almost kind of absorb some of their technique in writing as you, and then you, you bring that with you to your adaptation. That, and so you become a, it becomes a hybrid of you and that writer. That's, that's fascinating. Well, I, I decide what the artist is going to draw. But as I said, both those guys are very visual writers and it wasn't difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, um, why did you leave the book? Did you leave the book before it was finished? Which one? The Chronicles of Coram. You know, I'm not sure what happened there. I know that uh, at one point, uh, uh, an artist friend of mine lives in Canada. I'm just blanking on his name right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, took over uh, but it may be that I just had too much going on at the time yeah yeah because there's a lot you're doing a lot in, in, in 19 in 1988 that's true and we're gonna go to some of that other stuff yeah you um, left with like three or four issues to go and and it was after there was a a third artist that came on um Shane Bloom was the writer yeah yeah he it, um and I and then it changed um I, and I, I was curious about that. Now, Kelly Jones inked almost all the issues. So it had a, a at least that visual uh, consistency. Continuity. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's funny. I, I was just going to say that all of these, these things that we're seeing at first, um, at this point, a lot of these relationships carry over immediately over to D.C. when we get to D.C. Um, Kelly Jones, obviously, with Dead Man. Uh, but gold is the one that brings you over for right. um, for Flash. Uh, Greech, uh, obviously, I mean, there's just it's a lot of carryover uh, directly from first. Um, and back to you, Alex. Yeah, that's because that's because Mike moved from first to DC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and was he responsible for taking um, a lot of these people with him? You bet. He, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's how um, Larson got in there too. Was through Mike Gold. Um, so then, uh, so Staten now probably too. Staten, yeah, maybe, but although Staten already was doing stuff with DC, yeah, he'd already that, worked but at yeah. DC. Yeah. So take us to like, you know, how you first figured out or found out that first comics was ending, and then tell us about getting started up with Dark Horse and that transition. 
Oh, what, Alex, one, one thing mm -hmm. I, I was curious about um, that was also uh, first uh, the, the crossover series, uh, Crossroads. Um, that seems to mess you up every once in a while where you get stuck. I know with both Flash and there, it's just, it seems like it does. You've got carefully plotted out trajectories and it seems like crossovers uh, get in the way of that sometimes. What was what was your thought when they announced it first that you guys were all going to have to cross over something? You mean your first comics we were going to cross over with DC? No, no, uh, the Crossroads book where where oh oh well that that you know I was writing for a living and and if they say uh, uh, we want John Sable to team up with Badger, I said great. Oh, okay. Uh, right now I'm doing a crossover with Nexus. Lone Star and Bigfoot Bill. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, Bigfoot Bill with Nexus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so take us through that um, from figuring out that first comics is ending and then getting started up with Dark Horse and how that all happened. Well, I don't know. I do know that Mike Richardson was very interested in the characters and that. Uh, he bought the rights to them. He, at least he bought the rights to Nexus, and then he returned copyright trademark to Steve Rude and I uh, oh. in an unprecedented act of generosity, which has mm -hmm. never been repeated. The rights to Badger and Nexus. What, was it yours when it was under Capital Comics? No, we signed them away. We were young and stupid. I see. And then it got transferred over to First Comics, and then Dark Horse got the rights from them. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so then when you say he returned trademark and copyright, to, does he still maintain like film rights and things? Yes. Okay. But that's but because then, we signed a contract with him. Yeah. I see. So then uh, does he also, so then you have the rights in the comic media and then he has the rights as far as film and TV? Yes. Okay. That, that, that's, thank you so much for the clarification. I, I wonder about stuff like that so then um all right so then uh so it was more he sought your got your guys's characters out and your talent and so then you then you went with dark horse uh essentially that's what happened yes well how did so what led to him uh, giving the trademark and copyright back to you guys how did that happen sheer generosity on his part he just kind of said all right well look i'll just give it give it that's to you guys right. wow it just it, it occurred to him to do it. It wasn't That's your right. guys' idea. That's right. Wow, that is unheard of. I've never heard of anything like that before. Um, all right. So then, now tell us about the workings at uh, at Dark Horse. Then, essentially, you were saying that they were a comic series. So you guys were. It was a more leisurely pace. Were you ever? getting anxious like hey i want this out sooner and you wanted rude to be faster or how did that all just work or were you already doing other projects so financially you weren't that dependent on it coming out so quick well i was busy with other projects and uh you, you can't hurry the dude but he was working at a reasonable pace and so that we would have at least one mini series each year sometimes two now, um, in 1992, you guys got an Eisner for uh, Best Single Issue and Best Writer Artist Team. And then Rude got Best Artist. So tell us about the goings on as far as um, the recognition that you're getting after, uh, what, 10 years or so of, of, of creating this character. Well, it was gratifying. It was for uh, the Nexus, The Origin, which was a retelling of the first story we did. Uh, way back in the beginning, and I was happy to rewrite that story because I knew I could do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's always uh, gratifying to uh, be recognized by your peers for outstanding work, and mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. No, it's great. And then uh, Nexus Space Opera for Rude Dude Productions. Now, is that the story where... Um, is that the one where you were mentioning that he he changed the lines? Is that the one? He started changing the lines on Space Opera, but it really went full blown on the Gormando series. I see. Okay. Okay. So then how, tell us about some of those discussions. Would you call him and say, hey, what's going on? And and was it just too late by the time you found out? How, how was that? Yeah. Yeah. Because he was the publisher. Yeah. And not only was he paying me to write it, he was lettering it himself. I see. I see. Now, I think he's lettered the whole new book himself, too. I see. Yeah. 
yeah um okay and then uh now you were um going through the the nexus novel um tell us uh about the nexus novel writing it and what what you to uh, explain to the audience uh, uh, evidently without spoilers about what uh, what sets what makes this unique this nexus uh, novel that you've made well, a literary experience is very different from a comic book experience. For one thing, you can go into the story and the personalities in much greater depth. Mm -hmm. I wrote this last year at a period when I couldn't sleep, so I would just sit and write all day. And I had the whole story in my head from plotting it out for the dude. But when you get into it, as I said, you have to surprise yourself before you can surprise the reader. And I introduced many new elements in the novel, most notably... Uh, these twins, a boy and a girl who had a perfect telepathic rapport hmm. uh, and who had been given over to a criminal syndicate to be raised as assassins mm -hmm. uh, and who had been savagely mistreated. Hmm. And they decided to, to leave the criminal syndicate and burn it all down when they went. They didn't kill any of the students, but they killed all the teachers. And then they embarked on a life of crime uh, and eventually they came to Nexus attention because they killed so many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the cool. Th cryptic. The thrill kill kids. The yeah, kill dark, kids. dark cryptic stuff. Yeah. yeah. So do you find, um, you know, they say that if you combine genres, so let's say make, you know, combine sci-fi with, with uh, crime or combine sci-fi with, uh, you know, spy thriller, things like that. Are you finding that you're doing those kind of things organically uh, to, to get different plot threads going? Um, yeah, I do do them organically. I have a three-issue Nexus series coming out from Splato. Uh -huh. uh, and Richard Meyer solicited this from me, and he said, I want something like The Mandalorian. Well, I have never seen The Mandalorian, but I knew <laughs> enough about it that I knew it was kind of like a spaghetti western. Yeah. Yeah. So – this is Nexus in the old West on a certain planet. When he goes there to, to rescue this child, this is about three children it's called triplets uh -huh. and they have perfect telepathic communication as well. Only they're good. Uh, and because of their perfect telepathy, they become of great value to currency speculators because they can transmute energy instantly i mean information instantly across fast interstellar distances which is impossible by any other means mm -hmm. so they're kidnapped by this criminal syndicate and used to uh transmit information from one world to another across interstellar distances and the first world is very like the old west mm. that's cool yeah you know what you can do to explain that fast distance is neutrinos just say that word that works neutrinos <laughs> yeah see it worked <laughs> there like it is fractals too yeah there you go throw some of that in there it explains it um so all right jim dc comics okay so um i know that gold reached out to, well you started before flash you did some some other books um or at least some some issues atari like force atari force and then a uh an all-star squadron issue i think yeah uh, yeah some of that um was that did gold reach out to you to get those those jobs or only when you got to the flash i think that another editor contract contacted me about atari force uh i'd have to go back and look did richard bruning have anything to do with atari force not that i know of hmm. for some reason i thought i'd read something about design direction on atari force i might be wrong i thought so so was that your first sort of licensed property that, that you worked on? I think so. Well, yeah, what, well, you know, the, the Moorcock. I, I was going to say the Moorcock is kind of like that, but not exactly the same. What, what was it like working on something where you had, you're used to being able to do whatever you want to some degree, although you had editors, but with Atari force, I imagine there was more, um, uh, pressure to do certain things with it uh, and more uh, more supervision probably not really i mean there was no pressure there was supervision uh, but i picked up the continuity that had been given to me and just carried it forward i didn't make any outrageous changes or in direction or tone or style uh, 
as I said, I understand it's my job to entertain and, and I do the best I can with what I have. Do you consider yourself, and I could ask this at any point in, in, in this these questioning, but did you ask how lucky you were to get to work with the level of artists that you got to work with during this period? Because it's kind of a amazing group by, by this point. I mean, you're still relatively early in your comics career and you're hitting all of the up and comers before they really become, you know, the, the fan favorites they become. Uh, but it's an amazing list. And that includes obviously Atari Forest. Yeah, I was very grateful to be working with Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and uh, uh, Edward Barreto, Eduardo Barreto, great artist. And then of yeah. course, Kelly Jones and, and uh, our work culminated on Dead Man with the graphic novels which is where Kelly exploded into what he is today. Well, let, let's talk about 1987 and the flash and, and because that to me is a game changer book for DC. I mean, obviously it's, it's after crisis and they clearly want to make a statement and I don't know what they told you in terms of that, but it's redefining DC how they how they treat a superhero i mean not just because it's now wally west and not barry allen but just everything about that book was that you wanted to do that or did they say we really want you to change all the rules we want you to make this character very different from your typical dc character he's got to be edgier he has to have all these different um details it's 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 a radical departure i think and when I read it in real time, I both loved it and kept rereading it and also was like, that's wrong. He would never do that. Um, I mean, he's he's uh, sleeping with, well, he just keeps changing his, his, his girl. Like in the 14 issues you're there, he's like willing to go after the, the, the bimbo that's like, you know, with the old guy who she pretends is her uncle. I mean, it's, there's some gross stuff going on. Hot sexually stuff. In this. Hot yeah. stuff for its time. Yeah. Uh, and I know you were getting some fan feedback. I mean, like uh, pushback on, on this, what was going on in your head? Well, uh, I knew I had to make him different because they said, well, uh, Barry Allen is no longer the flash. It's now Wally West. And so I thought, what makes this guy tick? And he was a lot younger than Barry Allen. He was a young man, uh, a bit of a cad. Uh, he had to eat a lot to keep up his energy levels, to expend the energy that he did. And I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants, as I usually was in those days. In other words, I was drawing each book out by hand, panel by panel. Did Marv Wolfman ever come up to you and say, what What are you doing to my character? Because, I mean, at that point, he had been writing Wally West in, in Titans. Um, and it's such a different character from from the, the Wally West of Blue Valley that was, it seemed like, you know, America's um, uh, kid next door almost. No, no, Marv never said anything about it. Okay. And, and I think, and I think Marv was also doing his own revolutionary stuff with DC too. So I think at the time they were just going for, you know, John Byrne, Superman, and there's a lot of new weird stuff going on that I think you were just part of that culture, right. And revitalizing characters. Yeah. Where did you get giving him, having him win the lottery in the first issue? Cause that's, that's like, where did that come from as well? I don't know. You know, <laughs> I'd have to reread those issues, but it's funny because I, I hit that gong again in Florida, man. That's awesome. Oh, did oh, well. That's interesting. Did um, was it surprising to you that the Flash, those issues, those fourteen issues plus the special, weren't reprinted or available really up until recently? That they never did a a collection of them? Not really for being such a groundbreaking book um did why did you leave the book i ran out of ideas 
you ran out early. Usually, I mean, with Nexus, you're, you're still doing it. What, what caused it? It, would, it would never happen today. It would never happen again. And I'm, I regret that I that I quit the book. But that's why I stopped. I just said, Mike, I don't know what to do next. Now, did he he le he left his editor um, at the same time or around that when uh, I don't think so. I I had read that there there because another editor mentioned something about you moving to um, uh, said if if you like that weird Mike Barron stuff uh, he's doing Dead Man now and I but okay um, and was that a, a was that something, was Dead Man something that was assigned to you? Or yes, was it was. It, something you it was wanted? initially assigned to me. Uh, but once I started to think about the character, I realized that he was a horror character and not a superhero. Right, right. That's exactly right. Um, but does that but, appeal to you more do, uh, than, does horror uh, appeal to you more than superhero? I think so. I, yeah. Uh, now, you didn't rely on, on The Flash, just a couple more questions, uh, and then we go back to Dead Man. On The Flash, you didn't rely on any of the rogues gallery. Were they, was that your idea, or were you told not to, not to deal with those guys, to do all fresh characters? Well, we, we did use Vandal Savage. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I don't think of him as the rogues gallery completely i think of him earlier than that almost. well like captain cold and uh, those guys yeah no and if i'd stayed on the book i probably would have circled back and used those guys uh because that's what writers do they study the history for clues for the path to go forward uh but uh i just had enough fresh ideas in my head at the time just enough to carry me through those first through that first year because and for people who haven't read it, there's characters like Kilgore and, and Savage is the one um, continuing character and he comes back at the end. But you have Kilgore and you have Chunk, which uh, was a, a character that continued even after you left. Uh, the, William Messner Lobes did a lot of stuff with that character as well. Um, uh, were any of those characters in the uh, in the Russians? And I wanted to ask you about that because both with Nexus, but here too, you you seem very interested in in um, Russian both visuals and also as a as a plot device. Is there is there a reason for that? Yeah, I think they're funny, uh, and also <laughs> the history is fascinating, uh, and I'm drawn to Russian literature, but. Uh, I just, you know, it's just, I love to give guys Russian accents because it just gives me a kick. Like, here's a Russian grocery list. Biff, X, Mitt, his Russian grocery list. <laughs> well, you know, because you actually, that's almost straight from the comic. They, they <laughs> These guys as the messengers are. I love, um, I love to write, I love to write dialect. Yeah, those were good characters, um, and you had the the opposing the the B team of those, the blue team versus the red team, and you, you had a lot of Russian going on in that in that one. Um, all right, Dead Man, <clears throat> what did you think of of Action Weekly as a as a concept? Were you looking at those those the other creators too? I I love those those issues uh, with with the various ones. Were you paying attention to that or just, just dead man that you were doing? I was really just focusing on my own contribution. I'm sure I read some of the other stories at the time, but I'd have to look at those issues to remind myself. And after the book reverted back to action, that's when I uh, to a Superman um, title. Um, did you pitch the Dead Man uh, series, uh, the, the the prestige format um, books, or or did they come to you and say we'd like to do? Uh, we thought that was working well. We'd like to do do it as uh, in that prestige format. I think I pitched them, but I could be wrong. And. Was there any pushback to the visual change in Dead Man to make him not look like the superhero, but to be that um, bag of bones uh, look? Because that was, I mean, that's a huge departure visually that rewrites the character. 
uh, who had been around for a long time. I'm not aware of any pushback. And were you, but was it your idea or was it Kelly Jones's idea to, to do that? You know, I think uh, as soon as Kelly and I started working together, I could see those tendencies in his art. Uh, and it helped convince me that I was on the right path to treat Dead Man as, as a ghost story. Let's, um, were you at this time, because you were working at Marvel too, and you were doing a lot of different things. Um, what was going on with you personally at the time? Were you, um, was there a point where you were starting to, uh, the pressures were getting to you or you were unraveling a little bit or you were doing something destructive or what was happening with you? Because by the time you get to Sonic Disruptors, it seems like things are getting a little bit out of control at some point. <laughs> uh, Sonic Disruptors has the distinction of being canceled. And uh, the thing is that, that I, my, my writing techniques have changed drastically since then. I never used to outline, and I was making that up by the seat of my pants, moving panel by panel, and I really didn't know where it was going, except that it was going to end with revolution in the streets. Uh, and I think the sales were probably pretty bad, and that's why they canceled it. Now, when I undertake a project today, I work up a detailed outline. And the outline is not just a guide for me. It's something I want to be able to hand anybody and have them read it and be entertained. The outline is entertaining in and of itself. And of course, the result of the outline is whenever somebody reads it, they say, all right, yeah, where's the finished work? I want to read that now. So uh, I've taken a more analytical and a uh, uh, methodic approach to my writing. Uh, but the end result, I hope, will seem just as spontaneous. Now, did you have one issue that was, that was not released, that was, that was at least written? Or did you have the whole, um, did you have all 12 issues? No, I, I don't have an issue in the can. Oh, okay. So there's not a, like a issue seven or issue eight script? No. Okay. Do you, do you ever, because it is unfinished, did you, do you ever want to do something else with that or probably wouldn't be possible anyway? Um, well, in fact, I did. I created another series called Ethel, which wraps up Sonic Disruptor, but it was never published. Oh, okay. That's what I was looking for. Is that going to be published someday? Well, I don't Oh, it was about 10 years ago with a friend of mine who lives here in town and, and uh, was not for any specific publisher, but I'd be happy to send you the material that we have. Oh, I would love to see that. Absolutely. Uh, Butcher and, and Brave and Bold uh, in terms of that. Butcher was the character you created first. Now, do you have any, uh, any rights to that at all? Or any any connection with that, or is that just work product that, that you you created? Because that's yours. I mean, you that's solely your character in in that respect. But do you have any um, any relationship with DC on in terms of that? I would have to inquire. It was a long time ago, and of course, Butcher did some crossovers with other characters uh, that I didn't write or draw, so they may have a pro proprietary claim. On the other hand, they may not care, and they may say it's all yours. I would have to ask. Uh, did you enjoy doing that character? Yeah, I did. Yeah, because it's good. I, I enjoyed that that series uh, a great deal, and I enjoyed the um, uh, the Brave and Bold, which is confusing to people because Batman's not one of the three uh, characters in there. Um, but the question is... And I wondered about that. Did you write the question with the Denny O'Neill version of the question in mind or the Steve Ditko version in mind? Did I write the question? Well, yeah, I mean, the question's one of the characters in the Brave and Bold series. And I wrote it? I, well, you wrote the series, right? I don't know, I don't, that doesn't ring a bell. Okay. You you were you're listed with Mike Grell as co as as co writers on that. I'd have to take a look. Okay, Jim. Right. You know I'm losing brain cells right and left here. 
Me too. Yeah, I, he's he's a character in that um, that in the series. He's not a big character, but he's there a few times. That's all. Um, and then then Hawk and Dove, you do a, a version of that, which is again is a is a Steve Ditko uh, concept. That's what I was interested in. That it seemed like there was this period uh, right around the same time where you're doing um, you're doing various Ditko things. Do, uh, were you a Ditko fan? Well, I am a Ditko fan, but that's not why I, I wrote Hawk and Dove. They asked me to do that, and uh, I was happy to do it. And what was, do you remember what your concept was, how to make yours different from, from the various uh, versions of that? Uh, again, I'd have to go back and reread them, Jim. You know, it's just I'm like 20 million words beyond that now, and, and uh, okay. sometimes I forget what I wrote. I can't remember who my clients were from 10 years ago. So I, I totally get it. Um, Batman, you got to write some Batman stories during that period. Is that a character that you, that you were invested in in any way or wanted to write? Well, I love Batman. And I'd be happy to write some more stories, but I really prefer my own characters. Ah, so when you were doing this and in Marvel, you were doing the Punisher and stuff, was it kind of a less satisfying experience? Because oh, no, no. I love the Punisher. Well, I think that's a good segue. Alex. So um, when you first, how did you get uh, when you were doing when you got into D.C. and you kind of got in with um, my golden Atari force? How did you then go to Marvel? Who brought you into Marvel? Do you remember? Carl Potts. Yeah. Okay. And uh, tell us about we've interviewed him. We, we love Carl. Tell us how it was, how that, do you remember how that conversation went and, and yeah. then, and then working with Carl? Uh, Carl uh, said, I'd like you to write the Punisher because I, of the Badger, I was impressed with the Badger. Oh, cool. And he said that I do have certain rules. Everything has to make sense. Mm -hmm. It has to follow A, B must follow A, C must follow B. Uh, he was pretty hard nosed about that, but I never had any trouble because that's the way I write too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you wrote about 70 something issues of the Punisher. So um, tell us about uh, kind of getting into that character. And had you read the Punisher before on a leisurely basis and then you were happy to take the character on? Well, I read Stephen Grant's miniseries. When I wrote this character, I uh, addressed it as a straight crime story. Yeah. No super heroics or science fiction. He was out there to, to bust crime. Yes. And that... I worked at that for two to three years, and then Carl moved upstairs, and I got a new editor uh, who wanted to incorporate it more closely into the Marvel Universe. Uh, so there were some ultra elements, but I think it was under Carl that I brought in the Kingpin, who's a natural enemy of the Punisher. Yes. Yeah, because he's usually associated with um, Daredevil and Spider-Man, so that's cool that you did that. And I love the character Microchip. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, uh, I thought that was a cool concept to have this uh, kind of dorky guy in a van kind of doing some management. Um, tell us about creating Microchip. He just seemed like a necessary character to me. A Punisher couldn't do what he did without tech support. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, did, did was and I just asked this: Was Frank Miller's Daredevil in any way an influence on you at this point? Uh, or did you had you looked at any of that stuff? Oh, yes. And I admired it very much. I don't know how it affected me. I don't think it affected my writing, but I was a big fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something I noticed, like when I look at Atari Force and then I look at Punisher, like in Atari Force, there's a lot more dialogue thought balloons. And then in Punisher, it's more like captions with like statements. Um, was that specifically like, did you see like, hey, the industry writing why seems to be headed that way? Or were you like, this is a more, did you just, did you organically grow into that as like, this is more effective? Uh, tell us about that transition. Or organic. And I've been trying to get less wordy ever since. I see. So that you feel, do you feel that words can kind of distract from the comic reading experience sometimes? Show don't tell. Show don't tell. Every bit of information that can advance the story that you can show visually you should mm -hmm. you use words to for characterization. Occasionally, you can use them to advance the story, but only if it's natural. Mm. Have you ever, um, like, let's say you you see your comic like fleshed out, 
do you ever think, oh, we should just delete some of those sentences? They don't, they're not necessary anymore. Has that ever happened? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it does it. So maybe it was actually good for the artist to see it, to, to drop, but now you don't need the sentence. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So then, uh, so what were you, where were you living when you were working at uh, doing jobs for Marvel and DC like this? Madison, Wisconsin. So still Wisconsin. So you're mailing all your stuff in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everything so went by, by FedEx, the bills were enormous. Afterward, uh, Mike, you were actually worked with uh, Valiant. You did some work with uh, Archer and Armstrong. Can you tell us about how you got set up with Valiant at the time, this was around 1993, 1994. I ran into Bob Layton at a convention and we were kicking it around. He said, how do you like to come write for us? And the first book they had available was Archer and Armstrong. Uh, I would like to revisit those issues uh, because I didn't really feel that I found the groove there, but I did find the groove on a number of other uh, Valiant characters, notably Turok. Yeah. Yeah. which I did with Rags Morales uh -huh. and Shadow Man, uh, which I did with Vail Myerick. Uh, and I believe I did some Ninjak too. And those were more in my wheelhouse. Uh, but if I were to go back again and take another crack at Archer and Armstrong, uh, I'm pretty sure I'd nail it because my, my writing has changed drastically and my approach to writing has changed drastically. It's become... Uh, both more analytical and uh, looser. And I don't know how to, uh, uh, to reconcile those except to say that I spend a great deal of time thinking about the story before I write it. Right. And then when I get into the story, uh, I feel much more spontaneous because I know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so do you feel like now with these decades of experience that you kind of have a sense of what you need to put down and what you don't really need to put down in order to convey the same thing? And we're talking about basically a buddy, like a buddy crime story, right? Like it's two guys and they're buddies and they're involved in um, and they're dealing with like they're just dealing with different criminal hijinks. You're talking about this specific genre because the other ones you talked about um, first, were you a gold key fan? And then did you find, and, and you're saying that writing for like gold key type characters was different than the buddy crime genre. Is that right? Uh, well, I never wrote for gold key, but I was a gold key fan, but we did. And of course we did the Nexus Magnus crossover. So they had, they had control of that character. Uh, and I did like the, the gold key characters. I would have loved to take a shot at, at uh, Dr. Solar mm -hmm. man of the atom, but I'm, I'm happy with what I did there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I haven't looked at a Valiant comic in years. They keep changing. So I really don't know what they're doing these days. And then, um, and this was the same kind of setup as with Marvel, where you were basically mailing and stuff. It was not a local operation. It wasn't like you went over there and checked out, you know, what was going on in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the company setting. You were basically doing this from home, right? And uh, right. sending stuff in the mail. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and for Malibu, you did a, what, a Bruce Lee series. Yeah, I went after that. You want because you're, you're a martial artist yourself, aren't you? Yes. More of a martial craftsman. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so that, um, so a couple of things. First, are you a Bruce Lee fan in general? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, what was that one like? Uh, you'd be watching that in the movie theaters when it, like Enter the Dragon came out, things like that. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw it when it came out. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, beautiful. What What'd you think of the mirror scene at the end? Well, I had seen uh, uh, the lady from Shanghai, and so I knew where it came from. <laughs> uh, and, and everybody who's seen Enter the Dragon and knows about movies understands that it climaxed too soon yeah. when he fights uh, uh, the guy, uh, O'Hara, when he fights O'Hara uh, over the death of his sister. And then he fights that older guy. And, and the older guy was an accomplished uh, martial arts artist and Hong Kong actor, but he was no match for Bruce Lee. Right. So the long extended ending just felt like a tack on. I gotcha. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, actually. And wasn't that really possibly meant to 
highlight more John Saxon's role in the film anyway. And then Bruce Lee probably stole the show and they tacked on more stuff with him. Well, I wouldn't know about that. Although uh, uh, the director, who was the director? Ah, I forgot. Jim, what do you think? Do you remember? Robert, somebody? Well, here, I'll find yeah, out. I, yeah. Uh, he, he did a, a biography of Bruce Lee years later. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and I felt sorry for him because, obviously, that was the only way he could make money. And, and you know, directors shouldn't be reduced to uh, Robert Klaus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I had the biography, and it wasn't a bad biography, but of course it's nothing to that new biography which came out a couple of years ago. Right, right. Did well, you also, know there's I'm... a uh, Alex? Did did uh -huh. uh, did you know there's a um, there's a young adult uh, graphic novel of Bruce Lee's life out now that um, uh, that's very popular at children's bookstores. And yeah, I, I, I had read about that, but I haven't I haven't seen it. I, no. I've read it. It's it's good. You know, I mean, for the the audience base it's designed for. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to ask a, a couple martial arts questions. Go for it, Bruce Lee. Um, is he your favorite? What do you think of um, of Jet Li and some of the other ones? Jackie Chan, obviously. Uh, I assume you've watched most of those Hong Kong action movies. Oh that, yes, that period. Yes. What What are your favorites? My favorites are are the Ip Man movies starring Donnie Yen. I think they're the finest martial arts movies ever made. But I love Bruce Lee uh, because he brought a new dynamism and realism to the fight scenes. When you watched him, you got a sense that this was real, much more so than any of his contemporaries at the time. Uh, I love Jackie Chan. I love Jet Li. I love their movies. Uh, Jackie Chan has had a whole different approach to movies. Uh, he was a joker. Yeah, uh, a stuntman too, yeah. And he loved to enjoy, he enjoyed his movies, he wanted the audience to enjoy it too, and that's one of the reasons so many of his movies are so enjoyable. But uh, the most recent movie of his that I've seen was a British production called The Foreigner, based on a novel. Uh, and it's very grim, and it's far and away Jackie Chan's best film. He really acts in it. It's a superb film about revenge against the IRA, whose explosion kills his daughter. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, I urge you to see it. I haven't seen it. I've heard of it. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of the uh, the Jet Li, Sway Hark uh, films. All of those are uh, the Once Upon a Time in China's and the Legend of Feng Su Yuk. The, those things are just fantastic set pieces, one after another. Um, I wish Bruce Lee had gotten to do more, and 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 then we'd we'd have a, a better comparison. Right. Now, did what do you think? Did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? That Bruce Lee. Scene? Oh yes, yes. What, what what what's your take on that? And do you think it's uh, not accurate, or do you think it is? Uh, uh, it's uh, my favorite Qu Quentin Tarantino movie by far. I think Mine it's too. a I think it's a masterpiece. I could watch it over and over again, and I do think his take was highly accurate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because awesome. I think I think as and I think Jim feels that way too. I asked him about that before, um, and uh, and I think that's uh, there's a there's controversy there. Me, I always thought nothing could ever beat him. He was a human weapon, but there is something to be said about someone that is like has similar skills, but then is physically bigger than how then you know then maybe that fight would be real um, in that sense. Uh, and it's an interesting concept. Um, and, and, you know, Bruce was gifted with unusually fast reflexes and uh, quick muscles. Right. Uh, and which enhanced his strength greatly. But he only weighed 135 pounds. Yes. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, very light. Yes. So that just having mass with equal speed would be overpowering anyway. Um so then, uh, and then you mentioned Val Myerick. Um, and did you have an overall concept of Malibu or was it just kind of like mailing the stuff in, enjoying the series? Was there, what's your take on Malibu comics? Well, I thought they had a very strong line. I, I, I did that. They had a number of interesting superhero titles. Of course, I can't remember anything right now. Yeah. Uh, all I remember is my own involvement. Uh -huh. uh, and I but, was, but you felt that they were a good operation. I did, yeah. I thought they were a good line. I don't know why they went out of business. Star Wars. It's now you were part of it, not at Marvel, but at the Dark Horse um, in the nineteen nineties, um, and you did um, Heir to the Empire, Last Command, Dark Force Rising. Um, were you a big Star Wars 
super fan or was it just a work for hire kind of a, a job for you? Well, I was a fan. I saw Star Wars when it came out and uh, I consider the first three movies classic. Uh, I did watch one of the recent remakes, the one where uh, uh, Mark Hamill shows up towards the end of the movie at the very end. Uh, and I don't know, it just seemed like a make work project to me. Uh, and that's the only uh, post uh, uh, three Canaan movies that I've seen. Uh, but uh, I was happy to adapt it. Uh, I think that Timothy Zahn is probably the best of all the Star Wars novelists. Uh, and his prose was so uh, limpid and involving, it was very easy to adapt. I didn't use any of my own language. It was all Timothy's. Alex, what was what's the name of the uh, Star Wars film that's not in the um, in the, the the three trilogies? Um, yeah, Rogue One. Rogue, Rogue, Rogue One. One. Rogue One. I'll write that down. That actually is good, and, and it, it felt the way they connected it. It really was the prequel to the Star Wars movies that I was hoping to get when uh, when uh, the Phantom Menace came out. Uh, when I saw Rogue One, I was like, "This was the prequel I wanted the whole time." Um, I may I may have that in a box in the basement. Like a friend of mine just <laughs> let he gave me he went all digital and he gave me like five hundred DVDs. Yeah, oh that's cool. You should cool. dig it out because I think you would and, and let us know because it's it's right. it's very different from the ones that we're just trying to recreate. You used the word remake a few minutes ago, and I think that's sadly accurate about the uh, the 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 Abrams ones that they they seem like just a remake trying to to recreate the original trilogy to some degree and, and not doing it very successfully. Um, this one is, this one's more like a Kurosawa film than it is um, anything else. It's, it, it has a air of seven samurai to it. I think you'll, I think you'll like it. All right. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. Anything else about the, I mean, what, so was that the only work you've ever done for dark, uh, dark horse? Um, I did uh, uh, some stories, uh, about the uh, fighter pilot, uh, I can't think of his name. Something Antilles. I can't be sure. I'd have oh, to go sure. look. Uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Wedge Antilles. Uh, yeah, Wedge Antilles. Um, were you and and these were these were still adaptations, or, or was that an original story? It was original. Ah. And and would you what did you stop doing? Um, did you stop when when they lost the license to Star Wars, or did you just decide you didn't want to do anymore? Well, no, I was ready for whatever they handed to me. I don't know why I stopped. Okay, they may um, have changed editors. And I wanted to talk to a little bit about your novels. Um, and I, I will confess I haven't read any of them, but I was very intrigued by the um, uh, the Josh Pratt character. I, I did do some some research on on the books. Can you talk about those and kind of trace the um, what each each novel is about in terms of that? Because they it seemed like it was covering they were covering specific interest of yours within each story, taking it to a different setting and a different. Um, you know, one is, is music focused and others are different things. Go through those and then I may have, I might have some follow up questions on that. Well, uh, Josh Pratt was created uh, out of my love for uh, Travis McGee and John D. McDonald, my original inspiration. And he's a well known type. He's a rough, tough character with one foot in civilization and one foot outside. Uh, like Philip Marlowe or Jack Reacher, you know the type. Uh, but my unique spin was that he was a reformed motorcycle hoodlum who went to prison and found God in prison and comes out and tries to turn his life around. He's a very soft spoken guy. He's not a, he's not a wise ass uh, <laughs> like Spencer. Uh, and at first, the only jobs he can get are uh, delivering summons. But uh, the first book, which introduces him, uh, has him uh, breaking up a dog fighting ring. And because of that, he meets a woman. Uh, who puts him in touch with a friend of hers who's dying of cancer. And this woman who's dying of cancer, her baby was stolen by her ex when the baby was like uh, two years old. And this is 15 years later. 
and she just wants to see the child before she dies. And that sets Josh off on a quest that leads him through the Sturgis motorcycle rally and finally to a harrowing encounter uh, in eastern Wyoming with, with a monster who's uh, the guy that stole the child uh, who has taken uh, who did an unspeakable experiment on the child, which is based in reality. I don't want to go into it, uh, but it's the most harrowing adventure Josh has ever had. Uh, and ultimately, uh, he triumphs, but his girlfriend is killed, the one that introduced him. The mother lives to see her child. There's a twist ending. The second one, Sons of Privilege, is about a popular college athlete who's found drowned after a night of drinking and nearby there's a smiley face painted on a wall now this is based on the smiley face murders and they're real and if you google them you'll find out that the fbi had a task force for six years to try to find the reason about them and every one of them was a popular white college athlete found drowned after a night of drinking with a smiley face painted on a wall nearby and this leads him uh, to a gang in Milwaukee, among other places, and back into the past, uh, trying to track down uh, uh, just what caused this to happen, which is ultimately is traced back to a university professor who uses the dark web to spread a malicious philosophy uh, that successful young white college athletes deserve to die. And he refers to them as sons of privilege. And that's why the book is called Sons of Privilege. The third book is called Not Fade Away. And it's about a woman living in a trailer who was for a short time the girlfriend of a wildly popular, popular rock and roll star who wrote a song for her called Melissa. And he says, I'm giving you this song. And he writes it out on a piece of paper. And he says, this song, all copyrights and trademarks now belong to Melissa. And then 20 years later, she hears the song being used as a jingle for an insurance company. And that's when she gets in touch with Josh and said, this is my song. They can't do that. And that sends him off on a quest to prove that the song belongs to her. But the problem is that the guy who wrote the song, who is a, a superstar on the, on the uh, level of Jim Morrison, uh, died in a club fire in Denver years ago. Or did he? <sighs> See, nice. that's the one I wanted to read. I mean, when I was reading that, that's the one that seemed like it reminded me of you back to going back to Sonic Disruptors or Nexus with the music tour and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I think you'll dig it. There's a lot about the music industry in there. And obviously, I love rock and roll and I like to write about it. Yeah, that's okay. pretty clear. And that's not the first and last time. And then the fourth book is called Sons of Bitches. And it's about a naive young woman who publishes her own Muhammad comic. And then she has to hire Josh to protect her from the jihadists who are coming out of the woodwork. And that's an extremely grim story, too. Now, uh, the fifth one is called Buffalo Hump. And it's about a charismatic Sioux blues musician who's hired to open a brand new casino on the Missouri River in South Dakota. But he has many enemies. And so the blues musician's manager hires Josh to be his security and to protect him from assassination. And there's a lot about the blues in there. There's a lot about rock and roll too. Uh, the sixth one, uh, I'm going to have to look this up. Hang on, <laughs> boys. But that's the, uh, that's, that's quite a set. Now they're all available on Amazon. Is that right? They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I brought those up because it seemed to me that those, I could trace, I could go back and find Nexus issues that certainly are not the same plots, but have same interests that, that it's, it's a sort of a reveal of, of, of the things that you like to write about. And they're, they're all there from the very beginning, from those early first years at, at Nexus, a lot of them uh, are being re maybe repackaged. And that's not even the right word, rethought out to some degree. And that led me to the question, has your view on these things changed over time? Are you, in terms of, and I don't want to do it as politics, but in terms of just what your views are on things or how you, you know, because everybody changes as they get older. Are you thinking of, are you processing music and religion 
and politics, meaning like not Democrat versus Republican, but like the way it works on ne with Nexus and stuff um, in terms of the value of it or the, the, the evils of it. Um, are you, do you ha have the same views and same processes for that as you did back when you were doing it in the, uh, in the 80s? Oh, no, no, my approach has changed. Uh, I don't think my beliefs have changed that much, but I would sum up my approach to writing with three rules. My number one rule is it's my job to entertain, and I never forget that. As Samuel Goldwyn says, if you want to deliver a message, hire Western Union. Yep. Number two is to show, don't tell, which seems so simple on the face of it, but it gets very complicated, especially in prose, but I know how to do that. And number three is to be original which means to bring my own worldview to whatever I write. But I don't lay it on. I never preach. Uh, I let my characters speak for me. I'm looking at the number five, uh, Josh Pratt now. It's called Bloodline. Reform motorcycle hoodlum, Josh Pratt takes a job bouncing at Zeke's. A man can't just sit around. When Josh steps up to prevent a creep from hitting on a blonde, the girl's father hires him to keep tabs on her and, if possible, Lure her away from Orlock, the leader of a paramilitary gun-running Yugen motorcycle club. The feds make Josh an offer he can't refuse, then one that will test the very core of what it means to be a biker, setting Josh on a journey that leads to a bull breeding service, a racially charged settlement in the jungles of Paraguay, and a terrifying encounter with a demonic buffalo. No, <laughs> no I love buffaloes. Uh, I... <laughs> Hey, and I, a demonic buffalo, no less, almost like a Greek myth in a way. No, I, I want to push back just for a minute on that in that you're saying your your policies have, or your, your beliefs haven't changed, just your approach to writing. Yes. And I only say it because as a parent, once I had um, uh, my son, like my my tolerance for violence changed a little bit. There are some things, I, I, I'm certainly not anti-violence in terms of entertainment, but it was different after my son was born. I, I didn't have quite the same um, appreciation for it. it. I'd question it more. Are you saying that in the time since the 80s, your, your politics haven't changed, your, your notions of religion haven't changed? You're the, you're the same guy belief-wise as you were back when you were doing Nexus? And the reason I'm asking is so that when I go back and look at Nexus that I... I I, I have that understanding, and that, that's why I'm asking you. Well, uh, I think that I've certainly grown more tolerant of religion. Uh, that's the kind I'm of thing I'm, I'm asking you about. Yeah, uh, that, that uh, my wife is a devout Christian, and many of my friends are, and I respect that. Uh, and I think that Christianity is a force for good. Uh, I myself do not go to church. I'm Jewish by origin. Uh, I haven't been to temple in decades. Uh, I have Jewish friends who uh, keep me up to date on the holidays. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I remain pretty much the same I always have been. Uh, and uh, I try not to judge my friends on, on their politics. Uh, and I'm trying to hang on to all my liberal friends as, as well as I can. Uh, and unfortunately, I've lost a few. Uh, some have unfriended me simply because they found out I was conservative. Yeah, and we're going to get back to that in my final questioning of you in terms of, of some of the criticisms and things. Um, but I, I just, that's interesting to me. So if, if you went back and reread Nexus, which is very much about religion in its own way, um, often in a sort of a, with a little bit of a criticism of the cultness of, of it all. And also there's the sort of almost the false God, you know, of, of the, his power source and things. Um, are you, would you change any of it? Or are you stuck with a mythos that maybe you wish was a little bit more um, open or less aggressive against um concepts of religion or are you good with it i'm good with it cool <laughs> there's good. a lot of other stuff i'd like Jim. to change he's good with it he's good I, with it. there's a lot of other stuff i'd like to change but i'm very proud of my work on nexus um well that leads to a i have to follow up then what what is it what would you like to change oh well i would not have given up the flash 
I would have found a way forward. I, I stopped writing the flash because I told you guys I didn't know what to do next. That wouldn't happen today. Uh, and I'd like to take another crack at Archer and Armstrong. I believe I understand the characters much better. But I have to tell you that somebody else's characters will always take a back seat to my own. Yeah. And I because wish you stayed on the them. Flash, too. I, yeah. You were going in interesting directions. And no disrespect to anyone that followed it. And obviously, uh, Mark Wade did a, you know, really brought it into a, a different place entirely for the modern era. But you set up something that I hadn't seen at DC, and I was in, very intrigued by it. So I, I share you. your thoughts on that. Alex? Yeah. So um, tell us about uh, your current projects. So you've told us about Florida Man, um, Disco, Boy and His Dog. Go into, go into, tell, tell the audience uh, what you're up to lately and what they can uh, expect to see uh, from you and where can they get more of it? Are you seeing this? Yes, Nexus, yes. the novel. Yeah, we published this. It did very well. I'm down to about 50. Uh -huh. I'm writing a second Nexus novel. We're about to release a Badger novel. Oh, good. The Badger, oh, cool. the Badger novel is over the top. And if you like blues and rock and roll, you're going to love this book. Uh -huh. It's about how Badger hooks up with a, a legendary blues guitarist whose name is Dalton Seabury. And when Dalton was a very young man, he went down to the crossroads and made a deal so that he could be the world's greatest blues guitarist. And now the deal is coming due. That's awesome. Okay, good, good. And tell us more. Well, what else? Tell us about Florida Man. What are, what are we to expect from Florida Man? Well, uh, the novel, as you know, is the funniest book ever written. And right. uh, it's, it's by far my most popular book. There's a sequel out. It's called Hogzilla. I'm working on a, a third novel of Florida Man now called When Calls the Catfish. Uh, and uh, we are working on the Florida Man graphic novel. I don't know if you've seen it. Todd Mulrooney is the artist. He did this cover, which is the reason I asked him to draw the graphic novel. He's doing an outstanding job. It's on Indiegogo. It's, in, it's still in on demand. You can still get in and get the book. I guarantee you it's going to be the funniest comic anyone has ever read and they will burst out laughing multiple times. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, I'm also working on a graphic novel called Thin Blue Line. Mm -hmm. It's about a city that's experiencing mostly peaceful protests as we follow a handful of cops over a very long night. My artist is a full-time police officer. I will send you some of the art later. He's wow. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Definitely uh, a, a slice of life right there. Yeah, it's it, it's very realistic. Uh, you know, I, I think it reflects the times accurately. I also think it's very entertaining. Uh, I'm releasing a three-issue Nexus miniseries through Richard Meyer. Uh, Kelsey Shannon is the artist. And that's on demand if you go to the Impossible Stars Indiegogo campaign. It's an add-on. Uh, and Kelsey will be illustrating all three issues, and then we're going to gather them in a trade paperback. Uh, and I've also written a Nexus Lone Star Bigfoot Bill crossover that Matt Weldon is illustrating. Uh, and that's very exciting, too. Mike S. Miller has already contributed to cover. Matt Weldon has contributed to cover. Kelsey Shannon has contributed to cover. Uh, and they're fantastic. And I think it's up. It hasn't launched yet, but I think they have an Indiegogo page where you can take a look at the art. Mm -hmm. uh, Nexus, Lone Star, Bigfoot Bill. Nice. Now, uh, a quick question on uh, the Nexus. Uh, the So you and I remember we talked about this uh, earlier, is that you and Steve Rood have a co-ownership of the publishing rights to it. Does that mean that then each of you can individually go off and, and publish a Nexus without the consent of the other one? Yes. Okay. That's fascinating. So there's never any real need to reconcile continuity then. Or or do oh, you guys well, we, or do you or do you guys read each other's Nexus stuff? Oh, oh yeah, of course we do. We keep in close touch. I talked to him last week. Uh we're not going to, neither one of us is going to do anything that's going to rip the continuity apart. Dude okay. is absolutely uh, committed to the, to the Canaan. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. And then have you guys ever just out of curiosity, um, have you guys ever spoken politics to each other? And do you guys ever, have you guys ever argued or discussed it? 
No, we talk politics a lot, and we never argue. Okay, so you guys are probably pretty much on the same page, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and that's and that's awesome. And I was never really clear on that exactly. And then actually, that's a good segue, Jim. Go ahead for the final segment. All right. Um, a, a couple of questions. Do you think you'll ever do another Nexus story um, illustrated by by Steve? Well, we were talking about it, uh, but uh, I don't know if you've seen the. Uh... Uh, the movie Rude Dude. Have you seen it? It's a documentary. Yeah, it's a good one. It it, it goes quite in, in depth uh, on him. Yeah. Well, Steve's in a place where he really can't accept the writing of anybody else. If it doesn't come out of his own head, I don't think it meets his lofty standards. And uh, uh, so it's going to be doubtful uh, that we're going to continue Nexus, although I would like to. But the conditions he set down were so difficult uh, that I just don't think I, I need that trouble right now. However, I did just illustrate a 10 page origami story, yeah. which is another character that we created. And he's going to illustrate that it's going to be in the Nexus compendium next year. I see. Oh, great. So you might, you guys can still work together. You're probably oh, yeah. just not going to work on, on a, a Nexus focused uh, story. No, I'd love to work with the dude again, but uh, his ideas of Nexus are far from mine. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. And I think I understand that because when it comes to the, I don't want to call it drudgery, but of, of visually putting some together, whether it's drawing it or animating it or something, when you've written it yourself, it's there's a lot more inspiration to keep going through the drudgery of the detail of it. And maybe, do you think that's where he's at then? Uh, you've seen the documentary, right? Yes. All right. Well, I, I think that a lot of the answers lie in the documentary. Okay. Um, I, I have a Badger question also, because um, I, I haven't read, um, obviously I haven't read the new book because it hasn't come out yet, correct? It's, a, it's right. about to be come, come out. Is Because of when Badger was created, does he, is, his, is his origin the same? I mean, with so many characters they if they were like born of the depression they they have to be aged into a different era because he's vietnam um traumatized and, and the punisher has a similar issue um in relation to that do is he still the same character in terms of of uh post-traumatic stress from the vietnam war he's the same character but now it's from the afghani war ah so it takes an iron man uh marvel uni uh, cinematic universe approach to it it moves yes it Okay. We re we rebooted the whole thing uh, seven years ago when first published a new series, uh, and the first issue is a totally new origin story. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, I remember when I read that in what the Iron Man like the extremists um, series in two thousand or so. They they took the Afghanistan war in it, and then that made its way to the Marvel cinematic uh, universe and it's interesting to consider that the vietnam war just isn't pop culturally significant anymore that's a weird that's uh, to me that's a weird concept because as a kid it was a big deal but it's so different in, in terms of what did you view that as as an exciting um place to 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 take it in a different direction or was it more of a unnecessary a, a necessary evil because the vietnam war veteran has a very different experience coming back from um and and the and the culture at when he returns is very different from the afghan um war and, and things so i i just wonder are you, did you just kind of have to do it for it to make sense or, or or do you like the change i never do anything because i have to do it to make sense if it doesn't excite me it's not going to excite the reader i really got into it and i think it's one of my best stories great okay um last thing at least for me um we were you were talking about your um as a conservative and and things i want to talk a little bit about that in terms of uh controversies impact on your career if any um how you feel about it um and i guess my first question would be do you think that you have been has your career suffered from people knowing your political beliefs Absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. A lot of people unfriended me. 
Uh, and of course, now I can't approach either of the major comic companies, but, but that's all right. I mean, when I look at the stuff they're putting out, I don't think that I would fit in there anyway. Uh, but also uh, other longtime friends like Paul Smith. Paul Smith and I had been friends for years. We stayed at each other's houses. We rode each other's motorcycles. And one day he just stopped responding to me, just complete cut me out. And when I went to the Paul Smith fan page, I said, where's Paul? Has anybody heard from Paul? And I got a nasty letter from the administrator that said, you figure it out. And when I went back to ask him, I found that I'd been blocked from that page. Uh, and then I learned that Paul had been doing uh, anti-Donald Trump cartoons, which he's free to do. And I remain friends with other people who do anti-Trump cartoons. But I was shocked when Paul just cut me out of his life altogether because he found out I was a conservative. Do you, do you think that it's, it's solely that you're a conservative or do you think that there was this association and certainly not officially, but that you were you were um, labeled as a comics gate person. And that's a different thing from just being a conservative in the comics community that instantly stigmatizes you with, um, let's say a Mark Wade contingent that, that is actively, thinks that's harmful to the, to the uh, comics field. Well, I found myself on that list, but I've never identified as comics gate. That's why I'm asking you, because I didn't see where you had, you, you don't, you don't even necessarily defend it, but you don't attack it, which maybe is the line that, that you're required to do in, in comics. I don't know. That's why well, I don't know what I would attack. I may know, I know some individual people who identify as comics gay. Some are good. Some are a little sketchy. Uh, but to me, as I understand it, uh, comics gate should stand for pleasing the consumer. That's all it means to me. It doesn't, it shouldn't have any politics at all. In fact, it should be anti-political. It was a reaction to the politicization of so many comics. And that brings me back to my first rule, which is it's my job to entertain. And th that's what I seek to do. Okay. I, we just want to give people an opportunity to hear that kind of stuff without, you know, coming down in, in any direction. So we appreciate you, what you said, anything else you want to say about that? And my, I guess my follow-up would be, but that hasn't been what it's been to all people. There have been um, statements that have been made that are that are problematic. You didn't. You would acknowledge that. What are you talking about? In terms of comics gate, that there has been some. Has there? Has anyone that represents themselves in that direction that you think went too far or said something that you 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 don't think is helpful? I don't pay attention to what they say. I just, I, I'm not part of that community, so I don't read what they say. Uh, I do know that I, I never uh, engage in ad hominem attacks. I don't even use sarcasm. Uh, and I advise other people to follow my example, to, to not engage in ad hominem attacks or use sarcasm. I think it was Mark Wade that said that the reality is that comic book writers do fade away to some degree that they become you know it's a generational thing is there some truth to that that you would say that that people do age out of that how they're writing may not be what the what the cool kids want you know at the, at the same time uh, obviously you still have a following but in terms of uh in your experience because you the reason i ask you is you were one of those like new voices i mean you were brought into the flash specifically because you were new. Um, and so isn't that part of the comic industry historically from the beginning till now? Well, I wouldn't know. I can only deal with my own experience. But uh, I one thing that gives me hope is every day I wake up, I think I'm a better writer than the day before. Uh, and I'm now turning out the best material of my life. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. I'm doing all right. And I'm branching out into new fields. Right, right. Uh, and if you look at the... Uh, the comic industry today, I don't know any of the editors at the big two. And that's right. important. So a lot of it is also just maybe slightly aging out of that system, but doing quite well in, in the, in another system, right? Is that the deal? Yeah. Well, you know, I've been meaning to write novels for a long time. And it, yeah. And it just took me 30 years to learn how to write, but when I got it, I got it. Yeah. That's cool. All right. 
Well, hey, well, thanks so much, Mike. We really appreciate your time. And we know you're a busy guy. And it sounds like you're writing like four books at the same time all the time now. Uh, but we really appreciate the technique that you've shared with us. Um, you know, I, I actually do enjoy hearing the way you craft a story and craft a script. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I like to read a lot of your stuff is not because of the entertainment necessarily, but like how to write a story. And I find that that's just an interesting thing that uh, I find valuable. So thank you so much uh, for your time with us today. Thanks, Mike. And I'm going to read that one, um, that, that one, one of those novels, the one that I was asking you about, that, uh, that the, the fade. Josh uh, Pratt. Not fade away. Not fade away. I'm going to, I'm going to make a point of uh, ordering that uh, today. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. All right. We appreciate everyone uh, listening and learning more about the history of comics and all its forms.